Camera loves you. Oh, that, that's great. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'm glad, I'm glad they do. Yeah. Well, you got plenty more stories to share. I think we should start off with another invention of yours, which is this hand grip. It's a golf grip or a fishing rod grip. It's an all-purpose grip, really. And it's got little ridges on there for those who uh, swing so hard that it might just slip out of your hand. You need something to safeguard you. And uh, this is that product. How'd you come up with this product? The um, the real story was I was 42 years of age, and looking back now, I was losing my as as people will as they age lose their range of motion ability. Uh huh. That's everything from bending down, picking up something off the floor, tying your shoes putting on your socks, working in the garden, mm -hmm. fishing, playing golf. And it usually goes along with being able to grip with your hands like they used to do when you were 29. Mm -hmm. And I was 42, about 42. And I was beginning to, to notice I was losing the ability to hold on to Golf, my golf clubs. Mm. And um, so my sister-in-law was going through a change of direction in her life mm. with her husband, to put it mildly. And we moved everything that she owned out to our garage, which made it impossible to walk through the garage. You had to walk you had to walk through the garage in a narrow little space out to the to the outside and in the garage was a little work a workbench and you'd have to walk through all of their, her things mm -hmm. to get to the workbench turn on the light work out there at night and i was trying to come up with something at the workbench trying to figure out something that would help me play golf. And I said, maybe if I glue my hands, maybe if I put glue on the my golf grips, they were win, W Y N N, win grips, very famous grip. Yes. I said, maybe if I put glue, so I, I took Elmer's glue and rubbed glue on my golf grip. Make it a little tacky. <laughs> to make him tacky, that didn't work. <laughs> I went out to play golf, that didn't work. <laughs> that did not work. And uh, one night went outside in the garage and I happened to look over the corner. John, John will appreciate this story. And I noticed my sister-in-law, Amy, her two bicycles sitting over in the corner, mm. gathering dust. Mm -hmm. She never touched them. And I thought, what if I take her golf grips or what if I take her grips off of the handlebars? and take the grips off of my clubs mm. with my knife. Uh. And she will never miss them. So I took a sharp knife. Actually, it was similar to a, um, it was a carpet knife. Uh -huh. And I put the, put the golf club, I put a club in the vise, took the knife, and I took the grip off the, off the club and I took hot water and hot water towels and rubbed it around the bicycle grips and got them loosened and then took a hammer with a um, screwdriver and hit like a chisel mm -hmm. until they came off. <laughs> blew, them off blew them out a little bit, mm -hmm. put my finger in like this, slipped them over. Had no idea me measuring mm -hmm. circumference or diameter. I had no idea what I was doing. So I slipped them on. I said, oh, my gosh, they fit. But how are they going to stay on? Elmer's glue. <laughs> so I took Elmer's glue, poured it in the bicycle grip, put it on, let it set up. It did for a couple of days. And I went out to play golf with uh, Jeanette's uncle, 
at the, what was the name of the course, John? Chevy Odd. Chevy Odd Hills, which is now a housing development. And uh, the, the the number the number two hole it was it was a long par four, and I hit a lousy tee shot, which I normally do, lousy tee shot, and I was left with a long number not uh, long second shot, and I just said, let's try this out and say it was a three wood, mm -hmm. and I had put the grip the bicycle grip on the the handle. Mm -hmm. I hit a ball and it went out of sight. I drove the, I went over the green. I, I mean, I, and my uncle that I was playing with couldn't believe it, how I, it wasn't, it wasn't the strike. It wasn't the, it wasn't the swing or the strike. You didn't swing any harder than you normally. When I gripped the clubs, when I gripped the, the bicycle grips, which were now the golf grips, when I gripped them and I, my feet, I planted my feet. I just felt a kind of a new. You locked into. You felt just. I had the self confidence. Right, right. My balance felt better. Mm. I felt better about. I took a practice swing. My rotation seemed better. It really wasn't, but it seemed better mm. in my head. I thought I looked good. I didn't look good, <laughs> but it felt good. And I thought I might be able to make something out of this because. It gave me the ability to regain the confidence that I had lost mm -hmm. playing golf. Mm -hmm. And I re I recognized that I was embarrassing myself in front of other guys that I was playing with. Mm -hmm. And here I was an ex athlete. No, I should should not have should not have, you know, felt like that, but I did. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, so I went back home and um made sure that uh, there were two golf clubs. There were two two bicycles, and there were two golf clubs that I that I put the put the bicycle grips on, and um, it happened to be around Thanksgiving, and we always had what fourteen, fifteen, twenty people down. They fought deep. A bunch of people we had a bunch of people come down from Kernersville mm -hmm. on Jeanette's side of the family. You know, you know the, the 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 Crawfords, the Crawfords and the Cooks and the whoever, and they would come down and. Jeanette would cook, and in our backyard, there was a lake, and I used to drive balls. We used to hit balls, old balls that had smiles in them, you know, cracks, mm -hmm. old old driving range balls. Mm -hmm. We would we would go out there at night and hit them in the in the lake. Well, we were out there hitting balls, and uh, Ben Ben, which is Chris's son, was 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 that before Iraq or after before Iraq? That was before he went to Iraq. And uh, we were out there hitting balls, and um, Ed, Jeanette's uncle, who was president of H.E. Crawford Company, hosiery company, he was the inventor that invented all the the knitting equipment and so forth that he was famous for, um, was, a, was a good golfer, but he had problems in his hands. And he was suffering from uh, which, what, what, what now we call by the Duprane the Duprane disease. Mm. Uh, John Elway, the famous quarterback for the uh, Broncos, that oh wow, met you can't grip like you can't grip a a, a coke can or a, a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. You have trouble gripping, and um, plus the fact that he was a machinist and he had his had his hands uh, injured in designing all the new equipment and so forth. But it showed up in his golf game. He loved he loved to play golf. And he said, What you got there? I says, It's a it's a new invention. He said, What you, what what'd you come up with it? I said, Amy's bi Amy's bicycle, bicycle grips. And he says, Good for Amy. <laughs> Let's try it. And he was whacking the ball into the lake. Good <laughs> Good swing, whacking the ball, he hit the ball good. And Jeanette came to the door in the garage, and she said, "Come on in, put the put the feed bag on. Come on in, it's time to eat." And we turned away. It it took the golf club, and I said, "What do you think?" He said, "Make it," and he threw it. And I immediately turned around and gave it to Ben. Ben was the last guy that hit it. Ben could. Hit a ball a ton, mm. 
And um, I couldn't sleep that night thinking about how in the world was I going to find a way to make a golf grip out of it. And the next day, we were having breakfast, and I was telling Jeanette about the guys hitting balls out in the backyard before dinner and so forth. And and what and she said, "What did what did Uncle Ed say?" And I just said, "He said make it." And she said, "I think you ought to do that." She said, and in the meantime, I think you need to give Amy five dollars. <laughs> Why didn't figure it out? She Amy's never realized. We we've, we've been to China and made the golf trips. Amy's never realized it was because of her bicycle grip. When when was when did you what year was it that you made those? We didn't make them until about two years ago. But I mean, when when did you conceptualize it? When was that? Uh, when I was forty two. Wow. So nineteen thirty seven to and for, at forty at at it was I was born nineteen thirty seven. So I was forty two when I got the idea. Wow. So they've so, been on quite a journey, huh? Well. Life gets in life gets in uh, life gets in the way. But you never gave up on the idea and look at it now. It's here in the package. Yeah. Right? Well, you wouldn't believe what what we went through today. Here we are with you and Lonnie. It's in a package. Mm -hmm. We talked today to the manufacturer mm. in Clearwater. Mm -hmm. They own they own manufacturing plant in China and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So we 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 we, we re reconnected with them today with Austin Reeves. Even though there's American ingenuity and engineering and so forth, they actually are involved with, with people, the Clearwater people, involved with people in China. I, a job, what's the name of the place in China? It's Guangdong. What is it called? Guangdong. Right. And they they know how to make stuff. Yeah. I, I have faith in them. They really do. Yeah. They they took they took they took from a fat old guy nothing and made it into something. Uh -huh. well, where could, if someone wanted to buy one, where could they go to buy it? They could go to Amazon or they could go to our, they, they could go to staff at covers. Okay. Covers. Covers. Covers.com. Covers. Covers. Mm -hmm. Covers.com. Covers. Mm -hmm. And, um, but. It's on Amazon. But we, but last week I did a mailing last week to the, National Association of One-Armed Golfers, the National Association of Amputee Golfers, the National National Association of Blind Golfers, the National Association of Adaptive Sports Golfers. So I think we we sent out on Thursday twenty-two letters, twenty-two letters uh, with a uh, a brochure that shows the grip and. The information on the brochure that we set out uh, indicates that it's really made for the golfer that has disabilities mm -hmm. to overcome. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I, not for somebody like that just tries to swing too hard. It's for somebody who just needs a little little support. Well, you know, we welcome we welcome anybody to use them. Well, one of the funniest stories was a couple of years ago, John and Megan and his kids were at a driving range here in Sarasota. Ooh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but uh, they were out there trying the the uh, golf club with with a grip on it and so forth. And this guy came up and was inquisitive about what was going on. And he asked you, uh, was it any good for left-handed golfers? You think about it. I, I, well, I'm there not... are people that want to want to know. What if you're a left hand golf? Can you use that? <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, to inform the public. <laughs> I, I remember I used to actually work on a golf course when I was well, my first job at a country club, and I was I did the car, I did everything in the country club, but I was a car boy, so I'd be hitting clubs or hitting balls out of the woods, and and did, did the range picker and all that stuff. And I would have the opportunity to hit, just hit as many balls as I want too. And I remember I was, and I would just try to hit it as far as I could. That that was all I was interested in. And I one day I was driving the ball, and it was hot, and it's Florida, so my hands are a little sweaty. And I swang as hard as I could. The club slipped out of my hand, 
went behind me like a helicopter and it went probably 40 yards and it went over this uh, member that was practicing. He's about 100 years old, Dr. Odell. And it went maybe half a foot over his head. And he looks up. And I, I said, excuse me, I ran back and got the club from behind him. And I said, I'm sorry about that. You, 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 so it might be good for, uh, you know, I can see a lot of... You know, when they, when they came in, David, when they, when, when they were shipped to us, uh, Chris and I happened to go to a, pl a play, it, play it against sports. And I said, Chris, let's really see. Let's give it the acid test. Go on to China. We couldn't find anybody in America that would make them for me. Mm. Could not find anybody. They said, you. reminds me of a story that I want to tell you before I forget. He said, you're, you're too small. Years ago, I was living in Raleigh, and I had to go to Pennsylvania on business. I was with Prentice Hall, the textbook company. I had to go to Philadelphia for a meeting, and I went up and stayed at the Holiday Inn, and the Plymouth White Marsh Country Club was right close by. And the Plymouth White Marsh Open, it's a PGA Open they play every year. And a lot of was there. And a lot of the, the golfers were staying in the hotel, the Holiday Inn, mm -hmm. at e Exit 8 on the Turnpike, Pennsylvania Turnpike. Mm -hmm. And my brother Al, who was a policeman and a, and a great golfer, came at, met, met me from breakfast one morning. And sitting across from us was Chi Chi Rodriguez and his caddy. Mm, wow. And, uh, I said, how you doing, Chi-Chi? Good morning. Hey, good morning to you. How are you doing? I said, nice to see you. Good luck to you today. A little conversation. And my brother Al said, I sure would like to meet him. I wouldn't like to meet him. I said, well, I didn't do shit to him. So a guy got up and went over. I said, Chi-Chi, excuse me. They were, they were through with their breakfast. So I said, I have my brother Al, a policeman here at town, and uh, an amateur golfer in Philadelphia, Delaware Valley, would like to meet you. Oh, he said, I'm be glad to. He said, hello, Al, Alex, how are you, Alex? And they stood up and they shook hands and, and they, were, they talked and so forth. And uh, I said, Chi-Chi, do you have any tips for my brother Al? I was always teasing my brother. He was a great golf. I mean, he put, he put you to shame. And I said, do you have any tips for my brother? He says, Alex, hit and spit. What? Hit and spit. Keep your head down. Mm. And so before he left, I said, Chi-Chi, can I ask you one question about a story that was told about you? I want to find out if it's true or not. This actually was a true story. Mm. When he came over from Puerto Rico, was it Puerto Rico? I think it was Puerto Rico. And he learned how to play. Uh, I read with a, like the, at the, the palms, you know, there's palms of the, the, the bark that falls off the tree. Uh -huh. It looks like a high lie thing. Ah, mm -hmm. I I heard that he learned to hit a golf ball with that. Mm. Okay, so wow. Oh, uh, he 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 got better on the on the island. He was you know a golf famous golfer, and he wanted to join. As I heard the story, he wanted to join the PGA. And the story goes something like this: that he he spoke to the PGA official or you know, or or someone, and um was told that he was too small. Uh, at the time, there was Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer and mm. Julius Poros and all these guys. Big and big. he should stick to playing golf in, the, in Puerto Rico, I guess, with the little people. Mm. And he says, you're basically too small. And the story is you know, maybe not exactly like I'm, I'm telling you, but he was supposed to have said to the PGA official, but in, with due respect, you know, this business of being too small. With due respect, the ball does not know how small I am. <laughs> I've never forgot that. Mm. I never forgot that. Because isn't it true? Mm -hmm. Whether you're in business or whether you're you're a coach and you're coaching a basketball team or whatever it is, you, you, nobody knows how small I am. Uh-huh. And then I learned learned later that is that in St. Petersburg, he has a school that he finances and funds, mm. a private school for kids 
kids that um, are in our Navy. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful story yeah. about that. Yeah. But uh, but any but at any rate, um, uh, yeah, that was that was uh, that was that was that was quite a that that was quite a lesson that I learned in in being. He didn't talk about himself. Mm -hmm. He he was humble. It sounds like a a Puerto Rican Joe Panicello on a Tom White. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but uh, but at any rate, um, uh, the the I I really would have to say that I I told you I told John that we were at we were at uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, at the COs, and we were and one of the things that we were talking about were some some new ideas I had and. How was I going to find manufacturing, which we ultimately did with our ball caddy and the ball cover, mm -hmm. and uh, it, but the golf grip was always something we were trying to trying to figure out how it was going yeah, to find logistics. And I, I remember Jeanette sitting on the porch, looking out at the Atlantic Ocean. She said, "Oh, Joe, we just have to catch a wave." Well, I, I think I think it's impressive that you guys just. You're just normal people with big ideas, but you managed to make this thing a reality just by your willpower and you know not giving up at us. And uh, I think it's it's pretty incredible that you manage all the logistics part of it and saw it through. You can't stay with it from your idea, you know, forty something years ago, and then you saw it through all the way to the end. I mean, it's. Now, everybody has an idea, but then they go, where do I start? Where do I begin? And it's just so complicated, and I don't know how to get it. The, the Chinese sent us a prototype, and we put it on a driver. We got a nice driver, put it on a driver. And uh, Chris and his wife and myself, we went to see a patent attorney here in Sarasota. Oh, uh, Adam. Quite now. Port Portnoy, cool. right beyond the jail. And uh, I said, Chris, we're going to go see the patent attorney and we're going to find out. The market will tell you whether you have a good idea. Or so that, is that the first step, just so I can understand the, the process and for anybody who is curious about how to proceed, you go see a patent attorney first? Well, the first thing I wanted to do was protect the idea. Mm -hmm. We had a prototype. Mm -hmm. And... Went out and bought a went out to a sporting goods store and bought a bought a uh, a nice driver mm -hmm. and we took the, the the grip off of the driver and we put the the prototype on. Mm -hmm. So we made arrangements. Chris made arrangements to go see Adam Portnoy, the patent attorney, and we went down there and we had a Publix bag, a plastic bag wrapped around the handle. Mm -hmm. So we walked in with this driver, top secret, and uh, he. Went into the little conference room and he put out his clean legal pad and got his pen, you know, attorneys do, and looking for the button to, to push on the timer mm -hmm. and to start to start the the time. And uh, we said we had an idea and we wanted to see whether it would be patentable or not. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting in his chair and I was sitting at the end of the table down there and and saying to myself. Oh gosh, here we go dealing with attorneys. Because I worked for attorneys and I dealt with attorneys with sporting goods products, and I thought, oh, this guy's going to take us to the cleaners. Oh, he's going to find he'll find something wrong with him. And I was just I'm going it all in my mind. And he says, well, let's see what you have. And so he took the the public's bag off the handle, and he put his hands on, it and he stood up. He stood up. He pushed the chair back. He gripped the club. He said, yeah, yeah. And I sat at the end of the table and I thought to myself, it's in. He's in. <laughs> it's going to be patented. Yeah. He said, he stood up and he had that little wiggle. Mm -hmm. and he said, oh, yeah. You know, it sounded like he felt what you felt, just to kind of, it just felt right. And so you just know. Mm -hmm. You just know what it's right. So where in the process is it? Is, it, is this patented yet? or is it... Yeah, there's a patent on it. Wow. Congratulations. Patent on it, and it's it's out there for sale and uh, looking for a home. Uh, if you know anybody that's looking for looking for a good golf grip, but uh, but I think it actually will help people that have 
arthritis in their hands, uh, difficulty with gripping gripping something like like the golf club, a fishing rod. I think it will help. It will it will help people with a. You might have a disability and not even know it, because when you begin to lo lose your range of motion, which everybody does, you have a disability. <laughs> you do. You just you have a you have difficulty in reaching for things or bending down and drop drop something on the floor, and you can't get a, 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 a you can't grasp it. Uh -huh. And you know you're begin you're beginning to feel the effects, but you still want to be a player. Mm -hmm. You still want to play golf, for example, or, or you want to play tennis. Mm -hmm. you, you want to be a player. You want to you want to participate. This I think is going to get people um, back into back into the socializing with people and mm -hmm. and uh if if you do nothing if you do nothing but carry a few clubs in the trunk of your car and on the way go the way from home you stop at the driving range you hit a bucket of balls mm -hmm. that that's what that's what we're looking for mm -hmm. i don't think a professional pga golfer oh uh, that has com they have committees that decide uh, all about what equipment or what what clothing you wear, every everything. Mm -hmm. This is not made for a professional golfer who goes through a committee to decide whether or not it's official. It's not meant for that. It's mm -hmm. meant for guys like me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always told John and Chris that I don't I don't see it being used if, for golfers that carry fourteen clubs in the car in, in the in the bag. Yeah. I see it being used for golfers who have a little canvas bag and they might have three or four clubs in a putter. None of them mat. Well, that's how my set was. <laughs> None of them mat. None of them mat. Yeah. Well, you were probably you were probably a smart guy and, and you planned it that way. Well, I was I, I've had a few uh accomplishments, um, but I just did it uh just for fun, and I never got too serious with it. But um, as a side note, I will say one of my most uh, memorable golf experiences was we went to the, I guess it was the Arnold Palmer tournament in uh, Orlando with my brother, and we were watching, we were following Tiger around, and he was teeing off, and everybody was, of course, gathered around the tee box waiting for him to hit. We thought we are going to get ahead a little bit. And on this, I don't remember what hole it was, but there's, bunch of trees on the left hand side and so we were we were trying to get in proximity where we thought his ball might end up well as we're walking fast we see a, a ball hit go through through the tree tuk, tuk, and land right in front of us we go that's tiger's ball and so we were the first ones right next to it we gathered around and then everybody started to gather around us and then you see his caddy come through with with the bag and get set up and tiger hit the ball right right in front of us and it went, it was, it was probably five feet away from the hole. He went over the trees in the hole. And so I, I was never a serious golfer, but I'm always impressed with the game and what these people can do. It's just, it's uh, amazing how they can finesse them all and everything. And I, I, I was, I was impressed with the fact one day we were, we were down here and John and his family came down and uh, Meg, his wife said, Oh, let's go to a driving range and let's try it out. Mm. And I thought to myself, oh gosh, you know, a woman's gonna a woman's gonna get out there and she's gonna ruin it because people are gonna be looking and watching. And she actually had fun. Mm -hmm. Well, it drew attention from other people. Mm -hmm. And I just sat back. I just sat back. The old fat guy sat back, and I thought, you know what? This is entertaining. Yeah, this this draws people draws people in. Well, golf takes all comers too. You don't have to be a, a physical specimen, and you can you could be of any kind of skill level. And it's okay to embarrass yourself a little bit <laughs> starting out, but it's if, fine. If Perry Como were alive today, he'd be at the age that he'd be using my clothes. Like, can I tell you one funny story about the golf and, and and Perry Como and John? John was there with mm. the Duke Children's Classic was being played. And we were involved with, we, we got to know him and so forth. And so he asked, he said, why don't you and your family come over oh, one Sunday? It was the last day. It was, it was on a Sunday. Why don't you, you and your family come over and meet me on the 17th tee? 
and we'll and, and we'll 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 go together to the 18th because at the 18th they had all of the all of the uh, the trophies for the award winners and so forth. And the announcer was Gary Dornberg was the announcer, and they had grandstand set up there in the TV people and so forth, WREL. And I said, "Yeah, Perry, uh, that sounds good." He said, "What? Come over and meet me on the 17th tee, and we'll go in together." So. I drove up, we dropped Jeanette and her mother off, and they went up and sat in the stands at the 18th green. And uh, there were a lot of people were sitting there, all the, all the notable, all the notables were coming there. And um, uh, John was with me, uh, and Amy, Amy went with them, and John was with me. And uh, Perry drives, Perry comes up in his uh, golf cart, and I told John this story. He said to me, he says, Joe, he says, he says, wait a minute, let me take these shoes off. I think it was Foot Joy that had given him shoes and they they had somebody there, a sponsor. Mm. I had broken took, in, yeah. Took pictures of them and everything. Mm -hmm. And we were parked under these trees and he said, Joe, let me take these shoes off and put my tennis shoes off. He took these Foot Joys off, which was a really nice, mm. nice, go nice golf shoe. And he put on his tennis shoes. He's, oh boy. And John got in the other golf cart with Mickey Glass, mm. his manager. I don't remember who drove, whether you or Mickey. Mickey drove, and Mickey had wristwatches on his on his arms that day. Different players that were playing. Mickey was keeping up tires. the wristwatches, and he had wristwatches. <laughs> so Perry Perry teed off, and it was a little modest little drive, and we walked together, mm. and we talked. We talked about. Uh, the neighborhood and the family and the recipe and the sauce. We talked about everything but music. Uh, we were talking and he was there, took his second shot. The, and up in the grandstands in front of Jeanette were a man and a woman who lived in Stonebridge, our subdivision. They were neighbors of ours, an elderly couple. And um, forget their name, but um, uh -oh, the woman turned to her husband and um, said something like, Oscar, who's, who's the guy in the green pants and the yellow shirt with Perry? He is somebody. I know I've seen him on TV. He's a famous person. And she had binoculars and she was looking in a fairway. And Jeanette and her mom were there talking with Amy and her chatting. And, and this Gary Dorberg said, now approaching the 18th green. The foursome of Perry Como and I think it was Fred McMurray or somebody or and she and she was drilling this guy about this guy wearing green pants and, and yellow shirt with, with Perry. He's somebody. And she he says, Let me have those, let me have those glasses. And he was looking through the glasses and he said, Oh God, he's nobody. He's our neighbor, Joe Penichol. <laughs> and Jeanette's mother, she's she's turned to Jeanette. I heard later, she's, are you going to let them talk about Joe like? <laughs> and I don't. You you're the you're an unsung hero. I was the unsung hero mm -hmm. wearing wearing my green green golf pants and my yellow shirt. Well, if you wear you wear a combination that loud, then you're gonna. I was, you must be famous. It was funny. <laughs> that was funny. It was a great. So how did you how did you meet Perry Como? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm sorry. We were living in Raleigh, and John was at home. Mama Ellen was staying with us, and Jeanette. And I was working for Prentice Hall. And I had to go to Burlington that one day. The textbook adoptions were up, and the audiovisual materials that go with it were up, and we got approved. There was a science, I think it was science material. We got approved. And one of my responsibilities was to go and meet with the teachers to show them how to use the book, how to use the, how to use the stuff, mm -hmm. the shortcuts and everything. So I had to go to uh, Burlington. I forget what county that was, but it was on Interstate 40 uh, n n near Greensboro and uh, not far, not far from, from uh, Durham. So I went there and spent the day. We had lunch and we uh, met with the teachers and the, uh, members of the school school board, the committees and whatever. So we had a big show and we had a, the other companies were there and so forth. And 
And I kept looking at my watch and I'm saying, I got to get back to Raleigh because Mama Ellen's fixing, I forget what she fixed, but she was cooking dinner that night. And I said, I don't want to be late. You know, my mother-in-law is cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got in the car and I got on Interstate 40. I was driving Interstate 40. And I saw on the side, it says, turn, turn right to, to the governor's inn. And I thought, the governor's inn, that's the headquarters where all the celebrities and all the big, the fine people were staying for the Duke Children's Class. Mm. That's where the, that's where you would go and volunteer uh, to be a, 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 a marshal on the golf course and park cars or whatever. I said, I'm going to pull on in here and volunteer my name and Jeanette's name will mm. be volunteers. So I pulled in, I parked the car and I walked into the, into the lobby of the hotel and it was a nice lady sitting behind the desk and she said, may I help you? And I said, yes, my name is Joe Panicello and I'm here to volunteer for the children's classic. My wife and I would like to volunteer if there's something we can do to help the children's classic. And I said that, she said that to the, I said the, the Duke children's classic, the one that Dr. Dr. Arena from Duke uh, Children's Medical Center and Perry Como are involved. And I said, that, that's, the, that's the occasion. She's, oh, she's, would you like to see Mr. Como? It's me, Mr. Como. <laughs> and I said, sure, why not? And she said, well, just step this way. And we, she came out from behind the desk and we turned, walked down the hallway a little bit, a little way. It was the dining room, cafe, dining room. They served breakfast and lunch in this room. And as we walked in, there were these men sitting at a table. And um, as we walked in, this one guy uh, wearing a white shirt, say he, had, he had Duke Duke on it. And he stood up and he said, hey, Paisan, Goomba, how are you doing? How are you? It was Carmen Falcone. Carmen was the linebacker coach for Bill Murray, who was the head football coach at Duke. And Carmen was also the wrestling coach mm. at Duke. Mm. And I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, I didn't realize at the time about his his deep friendship with Perry Como mm. that went way back. But Carmen said, come on, hey, well, yeah. he says, come on in. I guess I want you to meet some paisans. And I thought, you know, what, who you did? I didn't recognize anybody. That, and there sitting at the table was Perry Como and Mickey Glass. Well, come on, pull up a chair. I pulled up a chair and I had some iced tea. And we were talking. Here's the funny thing about it. Perry Como said, how do you two Dagos get connected together? How do you two Wops get together? The Italian guy's talking. Mm -hmm. Carmen said, it's a long story. And this is interesting. The, the one sub one year at, at when I took the job at, at Riverview High School, there there is a God. When I took the job at Riverview High School, and I told Ed Brown, you just I said you just got it. You got a teacher and coach. I'm coming down, Ed, and I, I try to figure it out. What are we going to tell my wife when I get home that night? I think I've told you on this before. And I hung up the phone, and I thought, Joe, you moved too fast. We had $300 to our name in savings. We had $300 to, to, our, to our name. And I thought, what am I going to do to earn money during the summer? Because we're going to have to pay for this move to Sarasota. I may have spoken too fast. What am I going to do? And I was out, as I was getting ready to go back to relieve Brother Howard in my classroom, there was a bulletin board right there. And it had the the weekly schedule for things to do and so forth. And there was a sign in the bullet. It was there was a glass case. There was a sign. It said wanted. It said wanted. Uh, as program program director for physical education activities for the summer at Our Lady of the Hills Camp, run by the Diocese of Graysboro and Charlotte in Hendersonville, which was near, near Black Rock and near Asheville. It said, it said call, call Father Carroll in Greensboro or Carmen Falcone. I didn't know who he was. Call Carmen Falcone mm -hmm. at Duke University, and the phone number is over. 
So I asked the lady, I said, would you, uh, it was time and whatever you use the telephone, you ask for time uh, so you would get billed for it. So I called Father Carroll and I got hired over the telephone mm. to be the assistant, to, to be the program director and assistant to Carmen Falcone. Now, what I didn't know was there were kids that came in was for, the, for the entire summer. They would fly in from Puerto Rico, uh, different countries like Germany, Spain, plus the United States. They would fly into Asheville and we would send vans up to pick them up. And my job was to work with Carmen with the physical education program, the athletics. And that's how I met Carmen Falcone. Mm. And we had a home. They provided a home for us to stay, to stay in. Jeanette and I had the second floor. We had two bathrooms. Nice downstairs were the, the sisters of Saint Joseph. They were the nuns that taught the art, art and music programs, and that sort of thing. It was a great, great experience. Carmen's wife was the, she was the head dietitian for the athletic department at Duke. Mm. So she provided all the foods and everything at the camp for the. It was a great place. And when, when we finished, Father Carroll paid me $1,000 in cash. It was like I hit a gold mine. <laughs> but uh, how, how lucky would anybody be? So when I got home that night, one of the things that Jeanette said was, how are we going to live this summer? I said, got that figured out. out. <laughs> and we had to go to Kernersville, uh, We And Chris was a baby then. We went to Kernersville. And then Jeanette and I went to Greensboro to meet the priest, the father, Father Carroll, so that we actually had a physical contact. And uh, before the summer was out, I had a job offered to go to teach and coach at Charlotte Catholic High School, mm. which we turned down because I've already had a already had a contract with Riverview. Mm. But um, uh, that that's the way that all came about. Sounds but, like you do a lot of that. Where, as you as you put it, you told me one time you. you you do a good job getting the cat up the tree, then you just got to figure out how to get it out, all right? It's like writing a song. Yeah. So you, I think that's that's one of the amazing things about you is you, 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 off, you've, off the cuff, you just make a lot of just decisions and then you find yourself in a situation that many people would and have, have e yeah, have even, haven't even, even initiated. So. You have a lot of, you have a lot of. We ran into that with the sauce. Mm. We started getting orders and, and Jeanette would say, all right, big shot. What are we going to, what are you going to do now? <laughs> oh, by the way, I think I told you the last podcast, something was incorrect. I was reminded Ugh. the, the purchasing agent for, for, for Wynn Dixie, mm. I said his name was Joe Bryant. His name was Joe Burns, <laughs> and I will never forget that man for giving us a break. Mm. I will never forget forget that for the forget that man. He was he was he was an, an angel sent from up above. What? How do you how, how do you have such a good memory? That's what I want to know. You could recount all these occasions to the to the finest detail. Want to hear a funny story about Mount, about about our Lady of the Hills? Yeah. Carmen Falcon. Of course. Car we did Carmen didn't realize it, but one of his best linemen at Duke and one of his best heavyweight wrestlers at Duke was a guy that he coached who was my wrestling coach and football coach in college, mm. Russ Alk. Mm. Wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. And that, that even cemented the relationship better. But mm. I would go in and have meetings with Carmen on Monday morning, we get get all the staff together and so forth, and get our assignments. And then who's going to go to the airport to pick up the the flight from Puerto Rico, and what cabin we're going to assign to them? So forth. Every Monday, so I would get there, and we'd have the. They were all college kids. They were mostly Duke students. They were working for the summer. Well, they'd go and do their things. As Carmen and I were left, and Carmen would say, "Don't don't leave yet, Joe. Bill Stein's coming in." And I'd say, Bill Stein. And uh, Bill Stein had a boy and a girl that were summer summer campers. And they were from Long Island, New York. And um, Carmen said, uh, he's coming in. He wants to show us something. So the secretary would say, Mr. Stein's here, Carmen. And Bill Carmen, he would walk in. And he had a big brown 
big brown grocery bag, A and P or something like that. And how are you doing? This is Joe. And why are you, Joe? Bill Stein was big. big guy. He said, how are you? Good to see you, Carl. Okay, well, what do you got, Bill? Hold on. Hold your hats. I've got something for both of you. It's going to make the both of you guys a millionaire. Carbon's sitting behind his desk. I'm sitting on the other side. Bill reaches in, turns his back to us. And he says, voila. And he throws this, looks like a carpet on the floor. Carmen gets up out of the desk and is looking. What is it? And I said, yeah, what is it, Bill? You can't tell what it is. No, what is it? Come stand on it. Carmen gets out. I get up. We stand up. Rub your feet in it. What do you think? Well, what is it? It's artificial grass. And we said, what? It's artificial grass. And, and Carmen said, Carmen grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. He says, well, cows can't graze on it. He said, no, 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 no. You can't graze it. And I, and I, my father was a landscaper. And I thought, well, you can't cut it with a lawnmower. How are you going to, what are you going to do? He says, no, you blow it. You, you blow it and sweep it. He says, it's, it's artificial. So it's that so, they're getting an astroturf. So I said to him, well, Bill, that looks like a nice idea. Well, can you give me an idea of where you might be using this? We're, we're trying it out at a place in Houston, Texas. And we said, oh, yeah, I was thinking of some practice field or something. He says, the place is called the Houston Astronaut. <laughs> Is that right? That's true story. He offered Carmen and I, he was not the inventor, but he and the inventor worked together uh -huh. and he was going to do the marketing. He wanted to make Carmen and I the Northeastern and Southeastern representatives and work, work for Bill Stein. Yeah. Okay. So, so we just like, hello. And so he, he walked out and he promises, oh my God. So the next Monday we had to stand, here comes Bill Stein. He was staying at he was staying in Asheville. Actually, he had a place he had a place up there, some place. And here he comes the next Monday morning, and um, he's got a big old bag, and he's and he, and Carmen says, "What you got for us now, Bill?" He says, "I've got something for you." He says, "It'll make you guys a million dollars," and he and we said, "Okay, fine, we'll bite. What is it?" And he threw this stuff out. And Carmen started feeling it and passed it over to me. We said, what is it? It were, they were plastic splints. If there was someone that injured their arm seriously or their leg seriously or a burn patient, you would put this plastic splint on and it released the air that would blow it up and mm -hmm. would keep the leg or the arm in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It became... They still use it yeah, and they, yeah. and all over the world. And you can wrap it up and put it in your little safety bag. And when you need it, take it out and it blows up. It was, and, and when we thought that was a crazy idea. And then another Monday he comes in, this time he's got something wrapped around, like a towel wrapped around a golf club. We can see it's a golf club. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a golf program at the summer camp and I was in charge of it. We had a three-hole course. We had a little driving range and a three-hole course. Uh, it, was, it was like a par three. And uh, uh, the golf clubs came from Duke. Mm -hmm. we, we got old, old clubs. And, and anyhow, so here, so he takes the towel, takes, takes the golf club out. It's an iron. And we said, oh, it's an iron. Yeah. Oh, what, what, what iron? And, and Carmen was a golfer. And he says, oh, it was like a three-iron. No, and he says, it can be a four iron, five iron, seven iron, nine iron. And and I and I'm thinking, how can it be all all those things? Mm -hmm. He and another guy invented, and I don't know whether it's still there. On the end of the club, there was a dial. Click it, yeah. Click it, and you. In other words, if you were traveling on an airplane, mm -hmm. you could carry it with you. Huh? I don't think. And I yeah. I don't know whether it's still available or not, but I understand it sold like crazy. But I turned him down. So that was that was Bill Stein, and I would go and I would tell Jeanette. I would meet Jeanette and tell she said, "Oh my gosh, another Bill Stein story." <laughs> if we if we would have listened to him, Carmen and I would have been much we, we would have been in much better better shape. I'm sure. 
Well, you've come across a, a lot of iconic uh, sports products over your time, it sounds like. He was, Bill Stein was involved with the New York Jets. Hmm. Somehow he was, he had something to do with the New York Jets. And he was, in, he was in that, in that, that field and so forth. And he, he knew, he, Carmen really, no, I, I, I just met, I just met him for the summertime, but I, I thought it was a fun, I think it was one of those funny, funny things that happened along the way on our, on our trip from North Carolina to Florida. Hmm. And, um. You had to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to, you had to be there to to. Uh, I wish there was a video of it. It would be it would be laughable mm -hmm. because um, we were convinced that he was nuts. He was crazy. He was he was crazy crazy so much that I think he made made out well in it. So well, you you've had a fair share of ideas yourself, uh, John. Any stories that that are coming to mind that you want to hear? Oh well, there's 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 plenty. I'm the full of my thumbs at the Duke Golf Club. Twinkle. Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio. Joe D. Joe D. Call him Joe D. Tell us that story. The, they they were in the foursome with Perry Como, Sam Snead, Joe DiMaggio, and a doctor from Duke, right, John? A surgeon, and the doctors. His tee shot went off and hit somebody. Well, it 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 hit the lake. My mom and I were standing just down from the the team box. So it, that doctor hit and it hit the lady right in front of us in the hand. Oh no! So we we're hit her in the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she got whacked. Yeah. So everything was held up. Yeah. And. Joe DiMaggio was sitting in the golf cart and his legs crossed right about where, where Lonnie is. And I was here with John, Mom and Ellen, Amy, uh, Uncle Gary, no, Uncle Gary wasn't with us, no. We we're standing here and Joe DiMaggio was sitting in the golf cart and he's looking over toward us and we we're looking back and Jeanette had a camera and everything and we were looking over, and uh, also, uh, we, they held that their foursome held up another foursome, and he walked into a lady's house to use the bathroom with the golf cleats on. What was his name? A sheriff Lobo. He, what was his name, John? He played the sheriff Lobo. Yeah, he went in and used the ladies. The he walked in the door in the in the house and with his golf cleats on and went to the bathroom. And again, we're 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 watching all of this, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and we're looking over at Jordan. So Joe DiMaggio is looking kind of like, you know, and he says to me, you're going to look at me and stare at me all day? Or you're going to come over here and take a picture? <laughs> come over here and take a picture. Claude Akins. Claude Akins. <laughs> so Joe DiMaggio, I said, everybody, let's go over there. Let's go over here. Let's get a picture. And so we got over there and we got around him. And he, he's in Houston. He was, and he's direct down. He's a down. He said, have your what? He was telling everybody where to stand and everything. And he has a golf, a, 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 a scorecard in his hand with a pencil. And he's looking at, he's looking at the scorecard and I'm talking to him and I'm just sitting and I was like, and I'm, ah, oh, Joe, boy, oh, boy, my brother Al, we're just here today. My brother Al, he just loves you. I mean, even in baseball in high school, he wore number five and played left field and center field. And he's a great golfer. And boy, if my he's a cop up in Philadelphia now, but if my brother Al would rub blah, 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 now and then, uh, my brother Al, you know, and Joe DiMaggio is writing on this card. And I'm talking and I'm talking and I'm talking. And he says, Joe, give this to your brother. He hands me the scorecard. And I said, what the heck? Al, my brother, he says, Al, where were you? Joe D. <laughs> so, Tell the guy had a good sense of him. We took the scorecard, and I mailed it to my brother up in Philadelphia. And we said, let's wait three or four days, and then the phone will ring in the kitchen. It'll be my brother. Because he was one of these guys, was, he, was, he, was the, uh, he was the Dowling Thomas. Oh, yeah? Prove it. Mm. Oh, you can do, two, you can do 200 push-ups? Let me see you. Prove it. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so two or three days before the phone rang, 
Hello? Hey, this is your brother. What are, you, what are you trying to pull on me? What? What do you mean, what am I trying to pull on you? Ah, I know Gary's signature from anywhere. Don't don't pull that on me. I know Gary's signature and you two, you got up. He was referring to Jeanette's brother, Gary, who wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But my brother says, I know his signature. You, you phoned, he phoned up his signature and you sent it to me like it was from Joe D. Is that something you would do? And I said, <laughs> I said, I said, Al, it really happened. No, nah, don't tell me it really happened. Well, we found out later from his wife that he took a picture frame, right, John? And he had that, he, up, to, up to the day he died, he had that in a little frame by his chair. He, mm. he died of cancer. Mm. He kept that scorecard wow. with Joe D. He never, he never said, thank you, way to go. Yeah. Well, how did it really happen? He wasn't that kind of guy. Yeah. Really did appreciate it though. Yeah. But, but um, we we laughed laughed about the about the the fact that he was staring at us the same week. The same weekend, Prairie called me at the house and said he needed some more sauce. What well, you were working at the airport years later? They, well, you, was it later then? That was, but it was Joe D. It was Joe D. That. Uh, Jen DiMaggio and Frank Sinatra. Joe D wanted to win the salt. One of the salt. Perry and his wife had them fix the sauce at the hotel in, in the governor's inn. Uh -huh. Oh, they they fixed the They used the sauce. Joe D liked it. Mm. Perry said, "I know the guy who makes it." His wife. So we went to the warehouse. The guys who sauce and brought over. There. Well, Joe D was on the board of. He was on the board. The board of Mister Coffee, uh. and. His schedule was to fly from Raleigh Durham Airport to New York to go to this meeting, mm. the uh, the uh, the coffee Mister Coffee meeting, and then from there he was going to fly to San Francisco. And he told Perry his his sister was going to make sausage and peppers with the sauce, uh. and and uh, Perry said, "Well, how are you going to take it? How are you going to bring it? Travel with it?" Well, and then I said, "How is he going to travel to New York?" He, Perry said, he took his old underwear and clothes and wrapped the sauces. He wrapped the sauce up in old, the, the old his own, his own socks. Give it an extra flavor. <laughs> we help you. But, but so John, John was later on, John was at the airport and Frank Sinatra was using Julio Iglesias airplane. But before it for the Isaiah test. Mm -hmm. Julio Iglesias? Yeah. So, they were putting, uh, Sinatra wanted sauce. He wanted, he asked Perry to, to get some sauce for him. But he did the Duke show. This is. They did the Duke, the Duke celebrity. And Big show. Big show. Right out. Day right out. And then Frank Sinatra was the main. Right, that made a headliner. Wow. And then at that point, that's where he got the Perry games. But John was loading up, helping to load the plane. Did Joe D know you from... From before then, at that point, or did he, just another chance, just kind of met, like, met him through Perry. Wow, met all these people through Perry. Met all these people through Perry, and embarrassed myself. Uh, one time, John was there when I embarrassed myself. Who was it? Jerry Vale came walking up, and and Perry said, "Hey, Joe, I want you to meet Jerry Vale, an old friend of mine." Jerry, come on over here. I want you to meet Joe. And I said something like, "He said, Jerry, where have you been?" I thought he died. I said, where have you been? And he said, he said, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. You know, have you ever heard of Vegas? <laughs> and then he said, you ever heard of the cruise lines? <laughs> I didn't know what the cruise, I didn't know what cruise lines meant. Yeah. That was, I thought it was a ship yeah. of some kind. I didn't catch it. He, but that, I, he was in told him because you, you were saying his career was over, but he, but at, at the same, at the, at that same meeting, in that group was remember Dennis Franz John? Was he Dennis Franz was a on my PD and white simple. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't know these people, but yeah. you know, they were all friends of Prairie's and all friends of Mickey, yeah, Mickey Glass and so forth. Uh, mm. And uh, we just went we just went along with it. But John was low helping to load Sinatra's plane. I was I was at that time we were refueling the commercial air. Refueling the airliner. And then at the company that I worked for, 
they have the general aviation ramp is where that plane was parked. So at the end of my shift, I wouldn't park them. My big fuel truck got, and I'd stood at the stairwell. This before the, the, the photo cameras uh -huh. came up. As he was walking up, I stuck my hand out real fast and said, I'm Joe Panicello. My dad's name was Joe Panicello and, and Perry Colo. And, and he turned to me and he says, tell the old man, the sauce was good. It's awful. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Well, I work with said, what did he say? Tell, tell the old man the sauce was good. Yeah. Wow. Funny. What a compliment. That was quite, that, that all was quite an experience. And yeah. Sounds like fun. What a time to, what a time to be yeah. alive and alive. And, and, and then we brought some over. We had to bring some over and drop some off. We, we dropped some off. off we, I dropped off sauce at the athletic department uh, for Carmen and his wife was a dietitian. Then, and they got into, they were making, you know, making whatever they were making, the meals they were making using the sauce. And, but you know what? We never looked, we were never, we were never, we, it was, this was, these were occasions that came up that we were involved in. And, and we, we, we never talked to, to friends in the neighborhood. Fun moments, but you didn't hang your hat on. No, we yeah. never went around and told people at church or whatever that, you know, hey, we were, we were in with, we never did. It was, it, they were, they were ordinary people. They were celebrities. Yeah. Okay. They made it. They were, but they were ordinary. They put their pants on just like we did. Yeah. There's ordinary people. We had, we did some scanning for, um, a guy came in. He has, I'll show you it later, but it is a black and white negative of, uh, Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald performing together. And he had taken the picture and he never did anything with it because, uh, after he took it for Sinatra's people came up to him, he goes, you're not going to do anything with that photo. And he kind of gave away. So he's scared to print it out or do anything with it. <laughs> so it was like in 2018, he finally came and we scanned it and, uh, printed it out for him. But, um, Sinatra just had that, that aura around him, the, the whole Sinatra you just didn't cross him. It sounds like Sinatra was appearing one year at the Valley Forge music theater near Norristown, not far from where we live. And Tommy Lasorda's mother lived in Norristown. And uh, my brother was running around with that crowd. And uh, the, the, the Lasorda's, Tommy had some brothers that owned a restaurant at Bluebell, John. You ever, I don't know whether you ever ate there. Like, and um, so Sam hung around with, 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 uh, with Tommy's brothers and so forth and so on. And um, uh, so, Tommy said uh, to his sisters, "We'll make we'll make a special dinner, and we'll have Frank and his party over from the playhouse, the Valley Forge Playhouse, have him over." Well, Sam said, before they came over, they had to hire uh, construction and carpenter guys. To put braces, it was an old an old house they lived in mm -hmm. in, in Norristown. To put braces in the basement that would support and hold the floor for a big group. Yeah, that hold the floor. Just and, it. and Sam says, "Oh, what?" See, he says it was so comical. In that group, were all these people that that hung out with Sinatra, that they were always hanging out, hanging out on the fringe. Oh uh no, -huh. uh, they were part of the part of that. Was it the Rat Pack? Mm -hmm. The Entourage. Rat pack. And, um, and, and Sam said they had to block off the street where all these cars were all over the place. The police blocked off the streets. <laughs> wow. But Sam said it was like a neighborhood gathering. It, there was no big... They didn't care to get any public, publicity over it. Right. There were, there were people that made it. They were famous. But they just like to let their hair down and go in somebody, somebody's home and have good meal. I mean, I sauce. Have have well, it wasn't mine. It was there was Tommy Tommy's sisters. But uh, but anyhow, um, uh, uh, he he put he he put his pants on like everybody else did. Yeah, you know, I guess. And uh, 
But at any rate, the we had some. I told John today, I said that he grew up at a, at a good time uh, uh, in in North Carolina with the opportunity to meet all these different people. But it was it was really really good for good for, good good for him in his growing up years. Mm-hmm. He's gonna have plenty of stories of his own to tell his. Oh, and I'm sure and there are there are so many things that happen that are that are that that are true, but I think I think the way to get to get through them, and if Jeanette were alive today, she would say it's that self deprecating humor. You could tell these story. You're telling these stories about yourself. Act actually like we're walking up the fairway. Mm-hmm. I know he's somebody. He is some. I've seen him on TV. Oh, 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 him? He's nobody. He's our neighbor, Joe Penichel. What is? It sounds like it was something you would write for a sitcom. You know, of of everyday people, just kind of a natural comedy, I guess. But you know, all this sauce talks got me kind of hungry. You, you guys want to go get a pie? Oh, it's good. <laughs> so, okay. Sounds sounds good to me. Nice. Well, shall we do it? Let's do it. Well, Dave, it was nice, nice seeing you again. Nice to see you as always. I hope I haven't taken away too much of your... No, well, I, we talked to uh, we talked to Lonnie about you can come do it every Monday if you want. We'll come t- tell stories and chit chat. I'm happy to have you. Well, these were these were things that I think people people might enjoy, but they probably experienced the same thing themselves. In their in their in their day to day living with, and they, they could probably tell s- stories that are, that are similar, but they mean a lot to us because they weren't it's your journey. They weren't just chance meetings, but I think it meant a lot to us in terms of building a relationship, character, humility, uh, toughness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you, I think you in that era, you get people from that era come from a different, cut from a different cloth. You know, I think I think it would be bet, good for today's people to take some cues from your time, and it is you know with all the technology and the the pace of everything's moving. You know, I always admire you because you. You do the legwork. You you make the phone calls. You follow up, and you make these connections in a way that people just don't seem to have the time to do anymore. But you could see how all that interpersonal relationships that you've developed over the years has benefited you, and you've got a a rich uh, life of stories and friends and all these uh, moments that you made. Because well, well today we we want to run the phone today with a guy from. He's he's well established in the business world, the music field, acting, music. He's one of the Frank Sinatra impersonators, mm. and we talked to him on the phone today. And uh, they have a seventeen piece band, mm. and uh, he says, "Joe, we 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 love that we love that song that you know September you, and uh, but we want sheet music." And I said, "I don't have sheet music," and uh, but we need sheet music. We want the band, and I, and so I said, "Well, Frank, uh, John's here." Uh, yeah, well, I talked to John. It was like talking to a neighbor or someone you worked with, and it's going to turn out though. The relationship is going to turn out. We're going to help him, and he's going to help us, and the band is going to. The band is going to benefit from it, so we need we need to find someone who can write, who can transpose and write the the sheet music, and um, but that's something that's something that we that we that I don't do that we don't do, but it's it's interesting talking to somebody that you've never met before, that lives in in this case Long Island, New York, about something you've done that you created. And they find an interest in collaborating, working with you. To me, that's that. To me, that's that's meeting the challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's very flattering that someone would want to play the song you wrote. I mean, that's kind of the highest praise you can get, even maybe more than just someone 
saying they liked your song and they want to actually perform it. And he still doesn't know, does he, John? He still doesn't know that I don't know how to write music. <laughs> Let him figure it out. He's <laughs> probably figured it out. Yeah. He, he's probably, the guys in the band probably say, Frank, where did you meet this guy? Yeah. Anyhow. Well, well David, thank thanks you. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Let's get some pie. <laughs>